It was the summer of 2014, and for my son's bar mitzvah present, just like many Jewish parents, we wanted him to bond with the Holy Land. Oh, it worked perhaps too well. My husband had stayed back at the hotel, and our friends, my son and I, had just stopped in a pharmacy. Run! Run to the bomb shelter, sweetie! Please! Please hurry! I didn't hear the sirens at first, but the Israelis did. They're used to hearing these things. We ran to the back of the storeroom. It was a 12 foot by 24 foot windowless bomb shelter. My heart's pounding. Boom! Boom! I hear it and feel the percussion of the exploding bombs. I'm trying not to get sick. I look at my 13 year old son and I think I'll never forgive myself if something happens to him. That's an excerpt from a speech I gave to the Orange County Jewish Bar Association. It was the first but not the last time we had to run to a bomb shelter. Our adventure and my transformation is also the subject of my book, Blasted from Complacency, A Journey from Terror to Transformation in Israel. There is no chapter in a parenting book on what to do when a war starts and you're on a family vacation. Think touring extraordinary and sacred sites mixed with cowering in bomb shelters. I'm still trying to get over the Jewish guilt of taking my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. The impact of being human targets helped me understand the plight of Israelis living like this, and it also made me want to work on peace. How Israel is often described on the news is not what I'd seen with my own eyes. And I felt Palestinian parents also preferred their children playing safely in their backyards. The missiles exploded just near enough to blow apart my world as I knew it, forever changing me. And you'd never recognize my life today with what it was like then. I believe I found my life's purpose. Hello, I'm Penny St. And I'm the host of Peace with Penny. In today's episode, we will be speaking with an organization that works on peace between Israeli and Arab youth in Israel through tennis called Tennis for All. Jane Crivine is the founder and executive director of the Freddie Crivine Initiative, which administers Tennis for All. Today, we'll be speaking with her and their managing director, Lee Wilson. Formerly a UK concerts manager and arts festival director with 30 years experience in the classical music industry, Jane Crevine has been running the Freddie Crevine Foundation, the vision of her late father, Freddie, since 2005. Her father was known as Israel's Mr. Tennis. He was one of the six founder trustees of the Israel Tennis Centers. One of his passions also was to support tennis in the Arab sector by introducing tennis programs into the community. The Freddie Crevine Initiative strives to capture the imaginations of kids of all backgrounds and skill levels, bringing together a coexistence community of Arab and Jewish kids playing tennis together with the support from Arab and Jewish parents, coaches, players, teachers, and volunteers. So welcome, Jane and Lee. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to have you. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to begin with a clip. Freddie's daughter, and I'm responsible for running the Freddie Crevine Foundation. When Freddie was the president of the Israel Tennis Association in the 1990s, he became aware of the fact there were so few Arab children playing tennis. Tennis, 
חיים כבר מהגל שהילדה גודלת, ובאיזה גיל היא צריכה להתחתן, וזה ה... זה החיים שלו. tennis the behavior has changed so much coming to the tennis has made them more calm they are very determined to play to be big player one day what a yellow call yom is the per side of our side זה משמח אותי, וזה בעצם נותן לי את הכוח להמשיך. בטניס אין אלימות, זה משחק שמכבד וכדור. ואחרי כל משחק אנחנו לוחצים יד, אם זה ערבי או יהודי, אנחנו חייבים ללחוץ יד. אז אני חושבת שזה ממש דרך לשלום. מספיק שחבר'ה יהודים, ילדים קטנים, הם ערבים, משחקים ביחד. זה התחלה של השלום, לדעתי. Jean. So would you like to uh, talk a little bit about the clip? About the clip? Um, yes, although that very much, I, we're going to divide. First of all, may I thank you very much indeed for inviting us today to participate in your broadcast. We're very happy to be talking to you. This podcast finds um, Lee and I in a um, small community, really, a, a village called Binyamina, halfway between Tel Aviv and Haifa. And it's evening here. It's nine o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a beautiful day in a very wet month. And we're very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you. Lee is the managing director of the program and has been um, for three years doing an excellent job. And I have sidestepped a little bit because I'm somewhat older and ready for retirement. And I'm more her assistant than her boss. But we uh, work together as a, as a team and um, it'll give a, very much like to give Lee the opportunity to talk about where we are now and what we do. So you asked me now about this film, which we actually made uh, 10 years ago. I look a bit younger there, I think. <laughs> and uh, this is um, the gentleman who was interviewed at the beginning of the program is Sheikh Murad. He's a chef and the mayor of Jisa al Zarka, which is a village which may not be known to your uh, viewers, but they may know Caesarea, the famous um, now residential area of Caesarea, at one time a famous Roman port. And that is actually on the border of this very poor town of 15,000 people called Jisa al Zarka. Bridge Over the Blue, and it is a town which has very serious social problems, a complicated history, and um, part of the community was actually a, a tribe from the Sudan, which was brought over in the 1880s by the uh, representatives of Baron Rothschild. And he brought them over because these were people who were resistant to malaria and um, they settled in this town and they were uh, joined by other farmers and um, work, peasants and workers from the neighboring area. So it's a very much a mixed community. And if you were to go there, you would see people who look very, very much Sudanese and you'd see people look very, very much um, Levant from Syria, um, Palestinian, Lebanese, uh, Egyptian. The, the, the common link between all these communities, but they have serious social problems, a very low uh, level of income, very high um, level of um, violence and drug taking. And, uh, in, in that sense, I'm sure not so dissimilar to many American cities as well, with the problems that come with poverty and a lack of, uh, of what work opportunity. So this is where we, we start work because my father, uh, made Aliyah, that is, he came to live in Israel with my mother in 1984, and he was living in Caesarea, and he could see this village in the distance, this Arab village, and he was aware of the problems they had, and that's where the program began. And what you're seeing on the film, the program has been in action for about um, 10 years, and um, you see people with whom we're still very involved, 
including the young man, Mohammed Rashwan, who is our senior coach. He started tennis on my father's first program at the age of eight. He's now oh, he's 20 years later. He's 28 now. And um, <clears throat> he still, we still works with us. Um, and the two girls there are, are girls who are very typical of the kind of um, impact we have on the community. Um, one girl is from Gisal Zaka. The other girl is from a Bedouin town in the Galil. And um, she started tennis because of a project my father was running in the various um, villages in the Galil. Her teacher said, come on, there's a project. I want all you girls to take part in a tennis program today. Somebody's coming from Caesarea to set this up. We've got coaches. And that was her beginning of tennis. And that same girl, Bara, is now coaching tennis in the um, Israel Tennis Center in Tiberias. Mm. And uh, uh, the other girl, Ayat, has been gone to, gone to college, has started to be a teacher. And uh, Mohammed is still with us. And the fourth person you saw was um, Chagit Fieldman, who is... Um, managing the program on 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 the spot she's a was a junior champion herself and uh, <laughs> from Ashkelon and she now lives in Caesarea and she teaches she works with us and she's also a key element of our, our very small organization oh how wonderful it's wonderful to to see folks grow up over the years and be so productive that that is terrific so I you did obviously mention someone who is quite key to this, who, who was your dad. And uh, would you uh, talk to us a bit about him? Yes, I'd love to do that. Um, he's much missed. He died in 2005. He, his story is really interesting. He was born in Yorkshire in Northern England. Um, lived in a town called Harrogate, which was a very um, uh, well-established middle-class town there. His father was in the textile industry. He was importing his textiles from Europe. He himself was an uh, immigrant from a shtetl in Poland. He, he had a very thick Polish accent and um, uh, very, uh, he was very um, old-fashioned in his views. Um, but there were some um, problems with work at that point. This is 1920, 1922. And when my father was two, my grandfather took the family to France to another major textile centre called Lille in northern France, where my father was brought up and educated in French until the age of nine. The family, by then four people, four children, returned and went to England, went to London. And my father was educated in London at the Jewish Free School. I think at the time it was called the Jews Free School. He didn't oh. excel himself in his studies, unfortunately. And when he was 15, his father was despairing of him and decided to pack him off to then Palestine, where we had family. We had relatives who'd immigrated directly from Poland and Russia in the mid 20s and who'd settled there. And um, they had told my grandfather of a fine agricultural school which might suit my father very well so he was put on a train in London and on his own at age 15 he traveled to Palestine he arrived at the port of Haifa and enlisted in this school in a place called Pardis Khana and I'd like to add here that um, if anybody is familiar with Pardis Khana in Israel very near where I live in between Haifa and Tel Aviv there's uh, the, the, the area of the school, which was an agricultural school, unfortunately, is now a residential area, but they've kept the old gates of the school, the Pardes Khana Agricultural School, which my father attended for two years. And he then fell in love with the land, with the people. He made wonderful friends. But in 1938, he was 18 and he had to get to work and he returned to England to uh, start his career. Would you like to tell me a little bit, tell you a little bit more about what happened then? Well, uh, sure, um, but I, I, you know, next wanted to get into the whole discussion of of bringing tennis to to Israel. But um, Hi. he's he 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 has had such an interesting life. So uh, okay, if, there, if you just tell us a bit more, sure. Well. Um, he uh, was sent to um, work for an uncle who was importing wood from Finland. 
This is towards the end of 1938. And as everybody knows, by September 1939, war had broken out. He was 19 years old and he had to return to England, um, which he did uh, through a complicated route because um, the uh, borders were already closed. Then he managed to get to Sweden and from Sweden, he was repatriated by the British Embassy to London. He got to London and he was uh, enlisted in a regiment, a horse regiment, most extraordinary thing that they still had horse regiments there, but it was a combination of horse and artillery. And um, my father had hoped, I think, to, to, to join all his peers and his friends and his relatives of the same age and fight and fight abroad, but it was not to be. He was trained on horseback and he spent most of the war years um, uh, um, guarding the king at Windsor Castle. Um, oh my. He, he, I think he, he felt that he never really fulfilled what could have been his, what should have been his, his, what he would have wanted to do, but he was a good horse rider and in fact a good sportsman. And after the war, when he settled down, he started playing tennis um, uh, informally with friends on the weekend at the local local uh, council owned tennis courts it wasn't a private club it was a very um, unpretentious um, regular match for him he enjoyed it enormously and of course he had spent those years in Israel as a young man and he loved the country very much by that time the country was now a state of its own and his brother in 1952 his older brother David went to live in, in Israel and actually became the um, economic editor of the Jerusalem Post. And people who read the Jerusalem Post 20 or 25 years ago may remember the name David Cravine. So my father used to go with my mother and then later on, a years later with his children to visit Israel. We went for the first time in 1961 um, and then again in 63. And uh, then of course there was the Six Day War. But during this time he had um, good friends in Israel who he was friendly with at school. One of which Memi de Shalit had become the director of tourism in Israel. And my father who by then was a regular tennis player used to say to Memi de Shalit, Memi, why is there no tennis in Israel? You've got the most wonderful climate. It's a perfect situation. You know, we've, we've, in, in England it rains all the time. What about tennis here? And Memi used to say, look, Freddie, you know, we haven't got the funds, the there is no budget in the, in the sports, um, the sports um, department, in the culture, in the, the Ministry of Sport. We, you know, he said, what you should do, Freddie, you should come over here, you should do something, you should get involved. Well, this was early days, this was 1967, 68, and uh, the only tennis courts in Israel at the time were tennis courts attached to the hotels, the Arcadia Hotel in Herzliya, which some of the listeners may remember, those who had been to Israel, and one or two other tennis courts, but it really wasn't a sport that people were engaged in. Over the years, there became more interest in tennis and new immigrants came who were tennis players and um, one or two clubs opened and they um, even mustered a Davis Cup team. Uh, Davis Cup, if, I'm not sure if your listeners know, but it's um, the um, national tennis team. Each country fields a national tennis team and they compete every year in the Davis Cup. And it's a very prestigious uh, cup and it's the only team tennis sport that we know of. It's an international team's tennis sport and it, 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 it brings together the top players playing with each other rather than against each other. So um, by the which time I had come to live in Israel and I was doing an ulpan in Arad and my parents came to visit me and they um, were staying at a, the Hilton Hotel, which some of you know, may know in Tel Aviv, and they were in the, in the elevator, we call that England a lift, they were up in the elevator with um, a guy wearing um, whites and holding a tennis racket. And my father said, ah, you've been playing tennis? And the guy, his name was Bill Lippy, Dr. Bill Lippy said, I have been playing tennis now, but my wife and I are going to watch the Davis Cup. My father said, Davis Cup? We have a Davis Cup team. And Bill said, yes, we do. And so my father and mother joined Bill and Sandy Lippy and off they went to the uh, Davis Cup. And there was playing a young South African called Ian Froman. Ian is now... Um, 
one of the most respected people in Israel who had a wonderful history in tennis. But at that time, it was the very beginning of his career. And he was a young dentist, but his tennis was good enough to play for his country. He was an immigrant and they were playing in Tel Aviv. Sometime later, um, my father met Ian and met Bill Lippi again, and he discovered that they were talking about the idea of creating a tennis center in Israel, a center where youngsters could come off the streets, they wouldn't have to pay, they'd be taught tennis. It would be a sport that could engage the interest of people who didn't have much else to do. It was still not a, as, as um, in a sports sense, there was very little going on in Israel at the time. And um, there was a lot of focus on security. And this um, was not high on the priority of the uh, Israeli government at the time. So um, Bill, together with Ian and a few others, started thinking what they could possibly do to, to bring tennis to Israel. And at the time, Bill, uh, Ian had been playing tournaments in the United States and he'd come across these wonderful tennis centers, these tennis clubs that you have in America, where you have maybe 14, 16, 18 courts, beautifully laid out, beautifully managed. And he thought to himself, this is what we need in Israel. And he went back and Bill, Ian and my father, together with three other American businessmen, one doctor, two businessmen, joined forces and they became the founder trustees of the Israel Tennis Centers. Okay, let me yes, pull, up their, pull up their pictures. Well, here's a picture. Oh. Of, there they are, the six founder trustees of the Israel Tennis Centers. And then so Bill Lippi. Could you go across uh, from left to right and sure, tell us sure. who they are? No, sure. so this is quite interesting. I hope I get them all correct. So far left is. Um, no, I've got to draw a blank on that one. Let me do the second one. The second left is, is um, Ian Froman, Dr. Ian Froman, who was the South African tennis player whose idea this was. Next to him on the right of, of Ian is um, another doctor, Harry Lan Harold Landsberg. The next to him is Ruby Josephs, who was a builder. And he was a very important element to all of this because building, the experience of building was vital for the creation of this program. Next to him is uh, Dr. Bill Lippi, another doctor, and then my father. And on the far left, I'm really sorry, this is a real shame. It's just, I've just drawn a blank for a minute. I can't help you with that. It might come uh, back to me. It's but okay. I, while, while you're talking, I, I, I do have them all written down. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try to find that part and help you out. So go ahead. Right, so um, this was an immense program. They, they, um, they first went to meet the mayor of um, Ramat Hasharon and told him what they had it in mind. And he showed them strawberry fields stretching out as far as the eye could see and say, well, this land is available. And that's the land they took. And that's on which they built their, I think it's 22 tennis courts and an absolutely magnificent 3000 seater stadium which is called the Canada Stadium, as it was funded by the Canadians. But the point of which is, which is so important about this, it's not enough that these men should dream a dream. It's much more than that. They had to raise the funds. And this was the enormous battle they had. How and where were they going to raise funds for this, really, this idea, which was not medicine. It wasn't, you know, helping young mothers. It wasn't, um, it wasn't an obvious uh, target for fundraising. And they set up an amazing fundraising program with really innovative ideas. And it was the most enormous success as a result of their efforts and the efforts of people who became involved with them. They eventually paid for and built more than 15 tennis centers, the smallest of which is eight courts and the largest is 28 courts. I mean, these are absolutely amazing wow. centers all over Israel, as far north as um, Ramat HaSharon, as far south as Beersheba. Awesome. So let me help you with the names. There was Ruby Josephs. Mm -hmm. There was Dr. Ian Froman, Harold Landsberg, Joe Shane, Dr. Joe Bill Shane. Lippi, 
and Fred and your dad, Freddie Krueger. It was Joe Shane. There Joe Shane. Shane was right, 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 right. Okay. Mm. Fantastic. What? That's an incredible accomplishment. Um, so out of curiosity, did you um, have any top players come out of the, the tennis and education centers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was such a, a proof that you just need to have great coaches and um, a good structure to create great players. And um, the first generation of pair players who were probably in their 10 or 11 years old in probably 1981, 1982, were people like Shlomo Glickstein, Amos Mansdorf, a whole generation of really talented young players who went on to become top players at world level. They played US Open, they played Wimbledon, they were internationally ranked players, these, these young men. And part of the fundraising um, scheme that they use where they used to travel with these boys these children who were phenomenally talented and um, go to visit people's homes all over the united states canada britain france belgium switzerland and they'd be hosted by people who might have owned their own tennis courts a party would be given the children would be put out on the courts would sell themselves in exhibition matches and then the fundraising would start and all these gentlemen were terrific natural fundraisers. They were enthusiastic. They loved what they were doing. And these kids were absolute perfect examples of the success of the program. They weren't from well-off families. They didn't come from tennis backgrounds. They just had this opportunity to, to, to learn tennis. And they were being coached at a very high level. Well, your father, as we've as we've alluded to for sure, was just an amazing person. And I, I just amazed, but he, he was pretty much a feminist and uh, uh, promoted girls as well. Can you talk a well, bit about I, that? I, absolutely, because after these boys were making headway on, 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 in the national fo forum, mm -hmm. they, um, the, my father was, became more and more conscious that there was no interest in bringing the girls forward. I'm just going to... Yes, your, to... your camera disappeared. There you are. No, I'm okay. Yes, um, there was... Um, he could see that the, there were no, girl, no, no girls in Israel being encouraged to play. And he was very concerned about this. I mean, it's a very interesting thing about girls. I'd like to interject here with something which many of your listeners may already know, but it's such interesting information. Women in tennis was not considered of any interest whatsoever anywhere in the world. We're not just talking about Israel. And when Billie Jean King um, was in her junior and early years as a top player, she was terrifically aware of the fact that tennis was controlled by men. And men weren't interested in the women. And not only that, they didn't even think the women were interesting to watch. So when they had big tournaments, in it, it, whether it was Melbourne or Paris or London, the women were relegated to the outer courts. Because who's going to want to watch women? Nobody knew their names. They weren't familiar with them. It wasn't as exciting as the men. They just were present. Not only that, the men were earning 12 times as much in prize money than the women were. And Billie Jean King was saying, we girls have to have our own federation. We can't be pushed around by men like this. We can't be relegated to the outer courts and be paid this derisory prize money. And she got a group of women together. It's a famous story. It's been filmed. I hope perhaps one day you can watch it or you can screen it. A marvelous story. I'm and quite, she, quite interested because that, that is the time period that I grew up in the corporate world and went from clerk to supervisor to manager, et cetera. And I know what that was like. 
it was no different in the corporate world than it was in the tennis world. So I was cheering on as I was reading your your history and loved the fact that you were raised by someone who with such forethought. But anyway, go ahead. It's an exciting story to me. I'm just being disturbed and disturbed. I'm really sorry about that. Well, your your camera is there. You come on again. Right, right. So um, the um, it's interesting. Another thing I just read today that today for the first time Wimbledon, which is the British tennis, for the first time today it was announced that the price of tickets for women's matches will be the same as the price of tickets for men's matches. <laughs> this is a fifty-year <laughs> story. This is a fifty-year story of how really women have it took a long time. So my father was very aware of the fact that Israel was terribly behind. They also were not backing the women. They didn't regard the women as important. My father knew that if they would put money and, and backing to behind the talented women, they would, they would create champions. And he was so right. And nobody else believed it. He was right there at the beginning. He was committed. He raised funds in Britain, for people who believed in him. As a result of his efforts, there was, for a period of five years, there were three Israeli women in the top hundred of the world. Even Britain. Wow. Never Wow. They were that, Anna Smashnova, That's amazing. Anna Smashnova, Shaha Peer, and Sipi Opsila. And Sipi Opsila, for instance, who was a, a perfect example of my the prescience of my father, because she had um, financial difficulties and when she was already on the circuit, and she said, I'm going to have to retire and go into uh, coaching. I don't think I can do this. And this, this happened actually, she made this decision in. Um, in the United States, when she was playing Feder the Federation Cup, that's the Women's Davis Cup. She was in the Israel Federation Cup team. They were playing in the United States. Um, Billie Jean King was the, was the captain of the United States team. And Billie said, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. And Sippy apparently said, well, I'm having a difficult time financially and um, I'm going to go into coaching. And she said, Sippy, that is disastrous. You're a wonderful player. You could have a great future. And she spoke to my dad and she said, Freddie, can't you help her? And that's how it all, so Tippy had a wonderful career. She is until today, the longest serving woman in the Federation Cup team. She's retired now, but she was. How fabulous. And then your father also, just, I mean, reading his background is amazing, but at any rate, he also had a heart to help the Arabs and felt that they needed also to participate. So can you introduce us to that part sure. of his story? He had these, these, these very interesting years with the women and he also was not, not of the Federation Cup team. He toured the world and he was um, invited to become president of the Israel Tennis Association, which is the official body. And he enjoyed very much being president of the association. He um, gave prizes at the tournaments. He uh, attended events and um, it was something that gave him a lot of pleasure. And um, early on in his tenure as president, he was giving prizes at the national junior tournaments, the junior championships. And he, uh, as he was, before he was about to present the prizes, he said to the director of the tournament, tell me how many children did you have entering this year? Well, as, this is actually proof of the success of tennis in Israel because by this time there were 10, maybe 12 tennis centers all over the country. It was becoming a really dynamic sport. We had men and women in the world's top 100. And the guy said, it's been a great year. We've got, we have 600 entries. And my father thought for a second and he didn't even know why he asked the question, but he said to him, how many of those children were Arab? And he was so shocked by the answer, he realized that his job now was to introduce tennis to the Arab community of Israel. Wow, wow, and, and, and quite a job he did, but um, you really took his dream and, and expanded it with uh, the uh, Freddie Curvine initiative, Curvine, sorry, uh, initiative. And I, I'd really like to talk about 
your success and how you made that a reality? Well, he'd already begun some programs very yeah. early on. By 2000, he'd um, opened a, a Jewish Arab um, tennis program in the, in Caesarea. There's a tennis club there and they'd mm -hmm. offer the courts for free. And he mm -hmm. had uh, two groups of kids, all eight years old, um, 12 Jewish kids, 12 Arab kids. The Arab kids came from two villages, Faradis and Jisal Zarka. And he raised funds to bus them over two or three times a week and get coached by a very talented coach called Danny Meda. And um, that was a program that ran and ran. He didn't replace each year. You Instead of having more children join, it was always the same group. But this group had an immense, it was an immense impact on the children themselves. And when the children reached 18, when the Jewish children joined the army and the Arab children were then choosing their careers, six of them had the confidence to say, we want to continue our studies, we want to become professional. And five of them became, went and studied medicine at medical schools in Europe and are today wow. doctors. Wow. One of them became a veterinary doctor and he opened the first animal clinic in his village. And two became professional tennis coaches one of whom you've already seen on the initial film, Mohammed mm -hmm. Rashwan, and the other, Ibrahim Fahmawi, is employed very successfully at the Israel Tennis Center in Haifa. Wow. So that it, was this, how I this, started. This program has had such ramifications so far, even beyond tennis. It's just, it's amazing. It's a wonderful so I think program. I think you find that in, in your interviews with people, you, you know, it's, it's, as my father said, it's not really the tennis. It, it, you, it's, you have to do, it's doing something. It's, do, it's putting something into the lives of children, something that they can grab onto and gain from, whether it's sport or arts or science, right. something that they can um, emerge from their, the, the limitations of their lives where their parents may not even be literate to reaching a point where they know that this is for the taking. And um, this was the beginning of a big program he set up it, with a number of different, all over the country actually, in, in um, uh, about that time, maybe five or six different programs where he would um, have tennis coaches coaching children in the villages, in the communities. And um, that's where he was in, 19, in, in 2003 when I came to live with him. I, lived, I was semi-retired left my previous career of, uh, in the classical music industry and I'd come to live in Israel and uh, settle down and um, I helped him. I attended all the meetings with him. I wrote the minutes for his meetings. I made the tea when people came to visit him and um, it was an enjoyable year and I learned a, a bit and um, I admired very much what he did and um, he wasn't ill. He very quickly, uh, her cold turned into a um, pneumonia and very sadly he right. died when right. I'd been I'd, I'd been there um, about a year mm, so I was in Israel for about a year living here and my Hebrew wasn't very good and I really didn't have a career in tennis at all I didn't know much about tennis and I didn't know what to do because we had money in the bank we had a project going we had um, a committee a board on which as I think I've already described to you we had the uh, pleasure of having Ian Froman mm -hmm. who had a, a decades of tennis experience and we had a meeting and I said well what do we do and they said we've got to go on we can't stop let's go we'll back you in any way you want we're behind you let's go and that's what happened so from 19 from 2005 until today I um I took the reins and, and did what I could well, obviously, you've done an incredible job. Uh, one of the things I love is the motto that you have, children who play together learn to live together. And I, th I think that's so important. Um, do you remember how you came up with that? That's such a wonderful, wonderful representation of what you do. When I was in the United Kingdom in London, I uh, ran a PR company specializing in classical musicians. Our clients were big, big name recording artists. So I was always knocking out phrases that would strap lines, that would well, carry some weight. That that's a great one. That's a great one because it's so representative of 
you know, if if we only meet each other, it's 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 really what's needed. It's really what's yeah. needed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do you want to talk uh, a, a bit more? Um, let me pull up your your village. <laughs> now, now, seeing it on paper in English is a little challenging. Jizzer Azarka. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly. But can we talk about that village? Because it's so... Um, important i believe uh it represents so much of your program and and how you've taken those kids and villages and really um improved their lives far beyond tennis right well in a moment i'd like very much to hand over to lee who is so active today okay. in, in, in managing our programs. What I would like to say is just a little bit about what we're doing in Jisar Osaka before Lee continues with this um, the opportunity to tell you about what we do. And that is that, as I've described, it's a, a very impoverished village. It's got a very high rate of uh, violence, drug taking, um, it's, it's just an appalling uh, situation, which um, a number of charities have tried over the years to, to make an impact. And it is indeed very difficult because there is a community which is rejected by the other Arab communities in the, in, the, in the area. And they have a very specific problems of their own. But we were fortunate in um, having a use of two tennis courts in the neighboring Jewish community of um, Bet Hananya. We went to see them and we knew that they had two derelict tennis courts. And we said, look, if we were able to raise the funds to resurface these courts, would you let us use them for free as a center for the children from the, the, the local village, which was about a kilometer and a half away, maybe two kilometers away, because it was a wonderful environment. It's a beautiful Moshav, which is a community run uh, village really and um, it's a, an ideal environment and they said sure we negotiated a contract with them and we've had use for free of those courts since 2009 and we've been able to build up a really successful tennis school with children from Gisa Zarka and also from the Jewish community of Bet Hananya and uh, in fact we're about to resurface those courts in the next two or three oh. weeks when it stops raining and uh, continue, I hope, for another 10, 12 years, as we were. And um, this has become a center for us, not the only center, and it's not the only place where right. we work, but it is a key center for us. And we also, um, two years ago, started a homework club. And the reason we started a homework club is such an interesting thing, and I'm not sure people are aware of this. The Arab uh, community of Israel are separately schooled. They go to different schools to the Jewish schools. They learn in their mother tongue, Arabic. They learn all their subjects in Arabic. And they only start learning Hebrew from the age of nine. That Hebrew is taught to them by Arab speaking teachers. Now, some, something like 50% of the Arab community of Israel live in towns together with the Jewish community, whether it's Jerusalem or Ramle or Beersheba or Haifa, but the other 50% live in villages which are closed off in every sense. They're not part of the Jewish community, the Jewish community is not part of their community. So the children really don't get a grasp of Hebrew in the way they might if they lived in the big cities. And um, we became very aware of this because we were meeting teenagers who couldn't, couldn't uh, Keep a conversation going in Hebrew. They just couldn't do it. They couldn't understand simple instructions. They couldn't express themselves. And we saw a very real need to expose the children to Hebrew. And we have a, a wonderful team of volunteers who just chat with the children after their tennis lessons in our little tennis club by the tennis courts so that they will hear the language, start to express themselves in the language and feel comfortable in the language. Because how can they participate in the wider world if they don't speak the language of the country. 
The other area of expertise which we can add to this program is we have so many English speakers, including myself. So we have programs set par parallel where the children will have an opportunity to speak English, practice their English with native English speakers and practice their Hebrew with native Hebrew speakers. So that's the program of Gisel Zarka that we're now running. And that's a little description of the village. That's that's fantastic. I mean, there's like I said, your 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 program really covers so many different areas beyond tennis that just help the two sides understand one of the another. Um, so did you, uh, Lee, want to come into this at this point? Sure. And can you talk a little bit about how you got involved? Sure. I've been working, hi, Penny. <laughs> hi. Uh, well, I've been working for many years in the nonprofit sector in Israel, an activist center in Israel. And in the past few years, I was working as a consultant mm -hmm. um, for the New Israel Fund. The New Israel Fund um, would send me around the country to uh, consult and teach um, small activist groups and new profits. Um, how to run a nonprofit and how to become activists and how to fundraise and how to run their social media campaigns. Or and, I could use you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll and, have to talk uh, offline. <laughs> we'll chat later. And um, that's the way I met Jane. Uh -huh. And um, I was giving her some consultancy on her social media. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I was so bowled over by her history of her father, by the mm. work that she's put in by the work that this program does yet completely under the radar without people knowing that exists they were so busy working they didn't mm -hmm. think that they need to actually market themselves so that the people know that they exist unfortunately with fundraising it's a hard job out there to fundraise and the best way really to fundraise is for people to know who you are which is unfortunate because these small little non-profits put all their effort into running their programs and not marketing themselves mm -hmm. which takes a lot of effort so i was consulting giving because i'm consulting to jane about how to you know market herself and i was like you need to be doing this you need to be doing that and then in the programs you should be doing this you should be doing that and she's been doing this and she's like you know what i'm not gonna do it i'm just not gonna do it you've just given yeah. me too many missions i'm not gonna do it how about not enough hours in the day <laughs> Yeah, how about you come on and actually help me do it? And I just love Jane so much, love the nature, and I loved uh, the project. I said, right, fine. So I'd love to, thank you. And I came on board a couple of years ago. And the first thing we did was create a new strategy because they'd been going for 20 years. And I think it's important for any nonprofit out there, you always to reevaluate yourself. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you can in the beginning set a certain mission, maybe you've reached that mission, what do you want to do now? Mm -hmm. uh, you may have set in the beginning what kind of impact and times have changed or different things may have come up and you want to create a different impact. So it's always good to regroup, reevaluate and think, what is my nonprofit doing? Which direction am I going in? H how would I like to proceed? Ideas with Jane. And then we decided to call a board meeting together. So we called a board meeting of the very illustrious members of the uh, Freddie Kavin board, which made up with unbelievably amazing people, people who knew Freddie, Ian Froman, who's been discussed here, past players, all on this fabulous board of the Freddie Kavin initiative. So we got them all in the room. I was trying not to shake in my boots meeting all these fabulous people. Yeah. And we presented them, um, you know, their our ideas of what we've done so far. Um, a lot of times when you're working something, you don't really look back and say, wow, I did this and we did this and we managed to do that. And so presented them all their fabulous work mm -hmm. in a little presentation, showing them, wow, you've done this and you've done that. And mm -hmm. then we had a brainstorm. Now what? Where do we want to go? What, what what do we want to do mm -hmm. one of the things that they had discussed is that they had um, overextended themselves 
um, because so many people have heard about this wonderful program, been calling up and say, can you set one up in my village? Can you set one up in my village? Can you set one up in my village? And they had just gone from the complete up, up north in the Galilee to the south, south, south in the Negev. They had programs running everywhere and coaches everywhere. And, pro and a lot of times when you're overstretched, you end up doing a lot of programs, but the impact um, is not as great as it could be if you're in a concentrated, more concentrated focus. So we discussed what was Freddie's original vision and what is it that he really wanted to do and did it match with what we wanted to do today and um, basically came up with two ideas. The first idea was to consolidate um, all our activities into certain areas that we are the strongest at and in those areas that most needed us, that maybe didn't have any other programs running or didn't have the sports programs running or didn't have girls empowerment program running, areas that would really need us and would appreciate the work that we're doing and areas that we could expand easily in. So for example, if we were in a certain village and there are two other villages nearby, that's a great place. But if we're in one village and the other village is an hour drive away and our coach would have to drive an hour there, an hour back each time, then that would be a more of a burden on us than, um, uh, than it is on us. So we remapped, we re, uh, wrote together what we wanted to do when we came up with some ideas. So the first was the location and the areas. And the second was um, Freddie's real vision, apart from getting um, Arab children playing, was to get through tennis, Arab and Jewish kids meeting each other. So we decided to re um, strategize come up with a great five-year plan of what we want to do what kids we want meeting and and I can say three down three years down the line we've had um, three years of amazing summer camps Jewish and is and and Jewish and, and Arab kids with tennis summer camps and this year we're twinning one of our programs with uh, Arab villages with Jewish villages in the area where we're going to have a year long twinning program between the kids, it's gonna be permanent stuff happening. Um, and so it's great, you know, this is, we just try to regroup and rebuild. Would you please explain what twinning is? Ah, twinning, great concept, is you get a club and another club and you come together and you agree that we're gonna twin for a year. And the twin for the year would mean, first of all, is we would, um, market ourselves as a uh, twin together so we would share and we would tell everybody that we're twin together through signs through social media through joint uh, shirts joint hats so there's a branding of the two clubs as a twin partners in a program so that everybody gets to know and think wow it's possible look a jewish club and an arab club coming together and they're wow together and they're partners the idea is not to show that we're coming together play and go home wow Jews and Arabs can be partners and build something together so that's pretty good and the second thing is to have um, uh, monthly activities throughout the year where the two twin clubs would come together and have activities whether it's playing tennis together whether it's to celebrate Ramadan together or Hanukkah together, whether it's to get the parents to come for a parents day and meet each other and play parents against kids. Um, wow. All those kind of activities for a whole year to have joint tennis based activities between the children of the clubs and their immediate family members. Love it, love it. The what, uh, being a parent, uh... <laughs> our trip to Israel that changed my life uh, was a bar mitzvah trip. <laughs> I took my son to war for his bar mitzvah present. It wasn't really what I initially intended. But one of the things of raising my kid I've always noted was, uh, you know, you have, you're going to be a parent and you have all these things that you want to teach your kid. But what's most been profound is actually what he's taught me particularly about myself. So I love hearing how these children playing together have then influenced their parents to become involved. And if, can you say a little bit more about that? Those interactions kind of must be really because, interesting. Yeah, it's kind of funny because a lot of times parents are like, yeah, I'm really liberal. I'm going to send my kids off to, you know, meet our kids or, you know, uh -huh. get involved, but it's for the kids. 
It's not right. for them. You know, right. these are the kids they brought up. Right. And suddenly they find themselves at parents' day and joint dinners. And suddenly they actually see their kids. And then, you know what? For my kids, it's completely natural. They don't of course. see different. For right. them, it's kids playing kids, and that's my friend. That mm -hmm. you know, that when we play together doubles, we're great, and we beat all the others. And so mm. they realize how easy it is. And actually, all the stereotypes and all the problems are in the adults' heads. And right. it's the kids that can lead the way and show us that it's you know what we should be doing. So that's what's really great about it. Uh... On the pre-interview, I had to I had to laugh about uh, uh, the Korean band. Uh, <laughs> just what? the whole thought of that. Can you talk a little bit about that because yeah, it just so, cracked me up. <laughs> so we're always nervous about bringing kids together because, especially Jewish and Arab kids, apart from the usual stereotypes and the fears and everything, a lot of times with the kids coming together, they don't have the same language um, mm -hmm. as Jane. And um, mentioned earlier, they don't have the same language because Arab children learn Hebrew as a second language only from an older age, and Jewish children practically don't know Arabic at all. So it's really hard sometimes to bring these kids together. Sometimes the most common language is English, um, and sometimes more Hebrew, but you know, it's really hard. So that's why through play we bring them together. And one of the hardest things last summer is we had teenage girls and full on teenage girls uh, camp. And if anybody's had teenage daughters, will know how difficult it is to have teenage girls, a bunch of teenage girls from different paths coming together, a recipe for disaster. Most people try not to deal with those who are teenage girls, but we go in for it. We, we like to torture ourselves and go in for <laughs> some accounts of teenage girls. And, you know, you're always nervous. So we came up with all these ideas and we said maybe a good idea would be have a camp song. And on the first day, when all the girls come together, we'll say to them, let's play a song and that will be a camp song. And every day when the girls come together in the morning, we'd all start off by singing the camp song. So in our minds, we came up with a song. Let's say, what about, you know, these peace songs, you know, like Shalom Salam. Let's do the, you know, as Madrachim, mm -hmm. we were thinking of these songs. And then we said, you know what, let's ask the girls on the first day what songs we should play and that and that, that can involve them in choosing the camp songs. It's a good idea. So on the first day, we all get together and we explain to the kids we're going to choose a camp song. And we like play them all these peace songs and they're just looking at us, you know, these peace songs from the 1970s. And they're just like looking at us yeah. with these faces. And then one of the girls says, can I put a song? And we're like, yes, of course. What song would you like? And then she goes and chooses one of these songs from the BTS band, which is a Korean, Southern right. Korean, very popular band amongst mm -hmm. teenage girls. Right. One of the Arab girls, she chose this song, she put it on, and of course we looked at each other going, don't be so silly. You know, we're not having a Korean song in Korean for our Jewish Arab summer camp. And then suddenly see all the Jewish girls know all the words. And all the Arab girls <laughs> know all the words. And their first bonding experience was over this BTS song, which they all knew the words, they all loved. And they were like, you love it? So do I, I love it, you know? And they were all dancing to the song. And we were like, nothing like South Korean pop band to bring together Jewish and Arab teenage girls. So there you go. That was... Um, that was that's that's great. I mean, you know, whatever it takes, for sure. For sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you went home singing the song. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it stuck in your head in the end, doesn't it? Yeah, all of these these songs, you know, they they start going and, and they'd never get off our track. <laughs> That's fabulous. Fabulous. Um you also I love the fact you you even go younger with the mini tennis. And, yeah. and get things going right off the bat. Can you talk a little bit about that program? Well, I think Jane knows a bit more about the tennis because she oh. knows a bit more about the actual uh, professional side of the tennis bit. Do you want to explain a bit about how many tennis works, Jane? Yeah, with, with pleasure. As it happens, um, it's not new anywhere in the world. All tennis clubs introduce the small children through mini tennis. They give them rackets, which are... Um, 
the 23 inch, 25 inch, 27 inch, they're all smaller rackets than the adult rackets and they have a lower net and the net is mostly portable. So um, you set up um, the net um, on, on the court and um, you can mark out with ribbon the uh, side. So it's a, either a half size or a third size of a normal court. And then your children aged from four, five, six can start playing. And, you know, we'll have a, 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 a level, physical level and, a, and strength of their ability. And then later they can be introduced to full size court and um, the heavier balls, the faster balls. The balls are also softer in this. So this is, it's, it's not an unusual thing anywhere in the world to start young children. But for us, it's an enormous advantage because means we can take these mini tennis kits, these portable kits onto a playground, a car park, a stretch of road in any village and bring the children in, mark it out with the ribbons, bring them, give them all the little tennis rackets and the softer balls. And from the off, they can start hitting the ball across a net to each other. And that is the introduction to tennis. But this is uh, also in Arab villages. Yes, we take, uh, we've, been taking, we've been taking them into Arab villages for more than 20 years. So, so that's, that was really the you know the thought be behind what i was saying that yes. that you're you're starting young you're starting blending the communities working together uh and the benefits of that are enormous obviously i wonder, I wonder if i can ask lee to talk a little bit about the arab community of israel, israel. on, on Sure. I mean, uh, just on a general basis, the Arab community in Israel um, um, makes up of almost 25% of Israel, made up of various mm -hmm. different religions, um, different communities, whether it's Bedouin or, or um, Druze. Um, one of the... Israel is completely open inside Israel, inside the Green Line, um, to equal opportunities for Arab citizens, so equal access to education, equal access to jobs, equal access to everything. The problem is a lot of times, a lot of these Arab communities are uh, living in small villages that are cut off from access to these equal opportunities or even just um, uh, cultural differences create problems in accessing these equal opportunities. So a girl who maybe has grown up in her village and has never left her village her entire life, um, or has only left her village to go to another Arab village, um, would not necessarily feel confident enough, to, for example, to go to university in Tel Aviv, where if she did go to university in Tel Aviv, she could be accepted just as anyone else and study as anyone else. And in fact, um, the rule in Israel is the first year that you're in university, you can um, write all your papers in your mother tongue language in order to assist mm. people whose mother tongue language isn't yet up to this level of Hebrew. Um, but just having the confidence of being able to go into that university setting is, is quite is what sometimes holds back a lot of people. So um, this situation is something that we try to work on with our sports programs, because the sports programs is not necessarily just bringing Jewish and Arab children together, because obviously bringing them together will get them more to um, get used to being in, in situations with each other. But it's also to give confidence to these um, Arab children, especially Arab girls, to go out into the world and leave their village and have the confidence of going into um, interviews for higher education, interviews for jobs, uh, for even dreaming beyond what they used to be dreaming um, and think it is possible to do things. And if it's possible to turn up to a program and play tennis twice weekly, and if it's possible to speak with one of our volunteers and within a year be speaking English or Hebrew with one of our volunteers, if it's possible to come to a summer camp for a whole week and make best friends with a Jewish girl, suddenly their eyes open that they say, wait a second, I have lots of possibilities open to me now. 
and they're not so scary. You know, I managed to do this, this, and this, and this. The rest of it doesn't seem so scary. And that's why we, Jane's programs have had such a remarkable effect on children that now after 20 years, we're seeing the fruits of, of those programs. Um, only 22% of the children in the villages we work from actually graduate from school with any kind of matriculation, and um, which is such a low number. But the mm. kids we work with, we have a high percentage rate of the kids that have been through our programs year after year, finishing school, going on to higher education, as Jane said, even becoming doctors and coaches. We actually have a training program for children who've gone through our programs. By the time they get to 16, we can send them off and we cover the costs. We have a scholarship program where we go and send them off to become coaches, professional coaches, to train to become professional coaches in tennis. And then they come back and as a return for their scholarship, they intern in our programs as coaches. And this gives them a profession, a profession wow. that outside of their village. So it's a real great program that the impact is for long-term impact. Fabulous, really fabulous. Um, the ramifications of your, your, your program is are just immense. Um, I, for our last question, I wanted to ask how, uh, what, what do you see for your programs uh, as far as growing in the next five years? What directions are you, you looking to expand in? Well, you know, the first, the first things first, is um, just recently in May 2021, there was an outbreak of conflict in the in, with Gaza, and this right. led to an internal conflict in Israel with a lot of Arab and Jewish um, young men, in particular, on the streets fighting each other. In fact, in the areas we work in, on the main roads, there was lots of young men on the roads throwing stones and stuff at each other, and this scared people. This scared a lot of people in the country. You suddenly say, what is going on? And a lot of people reached out to us and said, we want to become part of your projects. And this, in fact, had a complete, uh, wow. was very, it was one of the stepping stones for creating this twinning program that we discussed mm. earlier. Because we started to do some community wow. programs between different communities. And this has grown into the twinning program. So what we would like to see is more of this community twinning of you know, Arab and Jewish villages coming together through tennis and coming together and matching and twinning with each other and putting on the table partnerships for long-term programs. And in fact, we've created more meetings coming up just this week with different mayors of different cities to see how we can expand these twinning programs. So the one thing is to expand intercommunal activities. The second thing that we'd like to see is to really expand our clubs into before corona we had four clubs running at the moment we've got two so we'd like to get the other two back up running now we're hoping that corona is going to uh you know come down a bit you know yeah. omicron hopefully it will be and um and then after those four clubs are set up properly in four different villages really to expand out of there, but not running off to the north and running down to the south, but from each club going to satellite areas around that main club and, and expanding that way. And that's how we see our work really taking part. And of course, doing the day-to-day, -day, getting those kids out there playing away from the TV screens, yeah. uh, a, you know, a, a, a racket in their hands, playing on the courts, taking them out for exciting activities is what we do a lot of the time and getting them to meet Jewish and Arab kids together through the tennis. Really fantastic, really fantastic in so many ways, you know, we really, there was so much to talk about. We didn't talk about how healthy it is and so on, but we all know that. Thank you so much, both Jane and Lee and Jane, I'm sure your father would be very proud of how you carried his dream forward to make it a reality. And um, 
it was fantastic. In Tuesday's episode, we'll be speaking with Elhanan Miller, a rabbi, Jerusalem journalist, researcher, and the creator of the online initiative, People of the Book. Its goal is to introduce basic concepts in Jewish faith to Muslim audiences and vice versa through a series of innovative animated videos and one-on-one -on -one interfaith conversations. People of the Book hopes to foster mutual understanding between Jews and Muslims and contribute to grassroots peace building. Peace in the Middle East is contingent upon better understanding of each other's religious and cultural backgrounds. A better understanding of Judaism can soften the animosity many Arabs in the region feel towards Jews and Israelis, acquiescing to Jewish existence in the land. Similarly, a better understanding of Islam can help Jewish Israelis understand Muslim sensitivities concerning holy sites and other points of conflict. Very little information exists in Arabic about Jews and Judaism, and People of the Book bridges the gap for both the Arab world in Arabic and Islam in Hebrew for the Jewish Israeli audience. I hope you can join Rabbi Elhanan Miller and me. Come learn about People of the Book and their efforts towards peace, beginning through understanding one another's religions and cultures. If you have a scheduling conflict, you can always see the recordings on my website at penny, the letter S, T-E-E -E dot com under podcasts. Thank you, and may you live in peace, shalom, and salam. Music